Okay, uh, so today's talk is about ferrite, uh, and ferrite actually is the most common phase in steels. So it's a really important uh, phase, but I need to give you a warning first, because today uh, we have a huge storm in progress in, uh, in, Cambridge, in Cambridge area, but over a large part of England. So this is a tree that has just fallen in my garden. So if there is an interruption, don't worry about it. Uh, we will continue on another occasion, okay? So, it, you know, we have winds uh, of the order of 70 to 90 miles per hour going on at the moment. This is the longest single span bridge in the world. So the distance between these two pillars here is about two kilometers. And it is actually in an earthquake zone. So it's a uh, uh, connecting the area near Kobe on the mainland to this uh, Awasi Island. And of course, it's uh, completely made of steel. Now, these ropes I will come to later when I talk about um, perlite, but this, these structures here, the majority of material in these structures is what we call allotomorphic ferrite or ferrite that forms by a diffusional mechanism. And you know, um, uh, when I visited this, it was shortly after a major earthquake, uh, which caused the displacement of one meter on the island side of, uh, of this bridge, and the bridge survived very well. So the steels that would be used for these constructions are not particularly strong because there are many other properties needed, uh, for example, weldability and toughness and so forth but they are extremely reliable. This bridge has been uh, now, I think it must be at least uh, 30 years old, but it still remains the longest single, uh, you know, longest distance between these supports of approximately two kilometers. Now, this is a, a building uh, in Taiwan. When I visited it, uh, I was able to go inside this building while it was being constructed, okay? So this is the finished building, but it is 101 stories high and uh, made from steel. Uh, but an interesting feature of this is because it's very tall, uh, it would have a tendency to vibrate in the wind or in an earthquake. This is in Taiwan, which is also an earthquake region. So what you do is you suspend from the top floor a massive steel ball about uh, 700 tons in weight, uh, which acts as a damper to the vibrations. So obviously here it's painted gold for decoration, but when I visited it, you could see that it was a series of steel plates which have been joined together uh, to make this massive uh, damping system, active damping system. And once again, you know, the steels that are used in here uh, contain a large fraction of ferrite. And uh, just to show you that, uh, you know, when you get to very tall buildings uh, and uh, you need very strong uh, structures, uh, the beams that are used are massive. So this beam, for example, has a weight of 1300 kilograms per meter. Now the structure of uh, the beams of, of this kind uh, will consist of a mixture of ferrite and perlite, okay? So this is the uh, typical structure inside such beams. And, you know, the carbon concentration can be, uh, can vary. This is only 0.04 of a weight percent carbon, but it can go up to 0.2 weight percent and still be weldable. But this particular structure is quite coarse here. This is not the uh, level of coarseness that you would have in a, properly produced beam, because we know from a lot of work that if we can make the grain size smaller, then we get an improvement in both the strength and the toughness, okay? So how do we make the grain size small? Well, um, this is a, a rolling mill. And, uh, And the first thing is that the austenite grain size itself must be very small because uh, basically 
the nucleation of the ferrite happens on the austenite grain boundary. So if you make the grain size of austenite small, you provided a larger number density of nucleation sites. And of course, austenite in steels like this only uh, exists at a high temperature, you know, above 900 degrees centigrade. So all the processing of the austenite is in order to achieve a fine grain size is done while it is being hot rolled. Now, the work on the refinement of grain size, there was a huge breakthrough back in the early 1960s in Sheffield, where microalloying was discovered. Okay, And you can find uh, a set of documentaries on this, which are produced by CBMM on my uh, YouTube channel, which explains the history of microalloying. And basically, you know, it created the market for niobium. Before that, it was just an experimental material, which you could obtain in a few grams. So you put in some sort of particles, uh, very commonly niobium carbide, because the hot rolling is at a high temperature, and you can get the niobium carbide to precipitate at a high temperature. So that stops the austenite grains from recrystallizing, and I'll show you why we need to do that. If you look at this graph here, uh, this is the austenite grain size being plotted here. And this is the starting grain size of the austenite, uh, you know, coming out from a furnace, for example, in a microalloyed steel. And what will happen is that as you deform the material, the austenite will recrystallize. Okay. If you are at a sufficiently high temperature, in spite of the pinning particles, austenite will recrystallize. And eventually, you know, uh, when the deformation is stopped, you will you will get uh, coarsening of the grains depending on the effectiveness of your microalloying additions. So we have two processes to control. One is you deform the austenite and it recrystallizes, and the second one is that in between rolling passes there will be time for the grains to coarsen because don't forget we are operating at high temperatures. So the work on this kind of rolling deformation goes back uh, to you know, pioneering studies by Mike Sellers and Urcola in Spain and uh, John Jonas and uh, Tanaka and so forth in Japan. And basically almost all the models uh, use this kind of uh, empirical equation. So this is known as the zener holloman parameter which combines the effect of temperature and the strain rate. So this is the plastic strain rate. And then uh, another empirical equation, which relates to your starting uh, austenite grain size, and V22, 23, and 24 are empirical constants, to the zener holloman parameter. So you can find the plastic strain that is necessary, uh, critical plastic strain, which induces recrystallization, okay, using equations like this. And there's an awful lot of experimental data which has been expressed in this way. So you can find these equations for many different kinds of steels. But of course, uh, the control rolling is not just a single hot rolling pass. Uh, there are multiple passes uh, between multiple rolling mills, and you get grain refinement, recrystallization, grain refinement, recrystallization, until you reach some sort of a finished rolling temperature. Okay? And that finished rolling temperature is important uh, in determining your ferrite grain size as well. So you will have a whole sequence of hot rolling passes, the aim of which is to get the finest possible recrystallized austenite grain size, or even leave the austenite grains in a pancake shape, uh, you know, a, a sort of a flattened shape, so that you effectively increase the nucleation rate of ferrite, not only by increasing the surface per unit volume of the austenite grain boundaries, but also deformation bands inside those grains will be nucleation sites. So once you have got to a stage where you've reached your finished rolling temperature, you will get phase transformation. And that phase transformation depends on the cooling conditions that follow the hot rolling. And 
those cooling conditions can be controlled in many different ways, including water sprays, etc. This is a picture I took in Brazil at CST. In terms of phase transformation, uh, we can take account of all the alloying elements by calculating just one parameter here, which is the driving force for the transformation from austenite to ferrite. In other words, the difference in the free energy between the ferrite and the austenite. And we can try and estimate the minimum ferrite grain size that is possible. Because if we say that all of this is consumed in providing interfaces, so this is the interfacial energy per unit area of ferrite grain boundaries, and this is the amount of grain boundary area per unit volume. But of course, we are losing austenite grain boundaries because they will be destroyed in the process. So there's a gain in free energy from this. This is the amount of surface per unit volume of austenite and the interfacial energy per unit area of austenite, austenite boundaries. Now, surface per unit volume is simply given by two over the mean linear intercept of ferrite from, from stereological considerations. And similarly, this term is two over the mean linear intercept for austenite grains. So if I rearrange this equation, what is the minimum value of ferrite that I, uh, grain size that I can get? And this equation tells you the minimum depending on the driving force at the temperature where the transformation starts. So if you cool more rapidly, then this driving force will be larger and your ferrite grain size will be smaller, assuming that other transformations don't become possible. And similarly, if your austenite grain size is small, then from the form of this equation, again, you reduce the uh, ferrite grain size. So if I plot this graph out, uh, the ferrite grain size here as a mean linear intercept versus, if you like, the undercooling below the equilibrium temperature, this is the driving force, then you get a curve like this, okay, which, which tells you that you know, in principle, you can achieve incredibly fine grain size if this is in micrometer. So this is about 0.01 of a micrometer, which is um, 10 nanometers. But when you look at a huge amount of data, this is the curve that you get experimentally. All right, that there's a huge difference here. And the reason is that as soon as transformation starts, it releases heat the enthalpy of transformation. So that heats up the steel and we effectively reduce the undercooling further. So you have to take account of this phenomenon of heat generated by the phase transformation itself, which, you know, in the thick steels that we roll, uh, there will be an increase in temperature as a consequence of the enthalpy change. So it isn't really possible to get a grain size much uh, finer than a few micrometers using control rolling. But I've already explained to you that if you change the transformation product, say if it is bainite or martensite, you can easily get to grain sizes in this region because you're not only operating at a large undercooling, but also the plate shape is determined by the strain energy due to the shape deformation. Now, the microstructure I showed you earlier had a little bit of anisotropy, you know, the perlite in it was uh, aligned. And in three dimensions, you know, it, it looks like this, that you have this bending of the perlite, okay? And these are not continuous bends. You know, if you look at this surface, uh, then you can see that it's very patchy. So these are, uh, we often talk about these as layers of ferrite and perlite, but they're not. They are patches of perlite and um, ferrite which are drawn out from the dendritic solidification and the chemical segregation that accompanies dendritic solidification. So you will get manganese rich and manganese poor regions in your steel uh, from the non-equilibrium solidification, which are drawn out roughly into this layer-like structure. And ferrite formation starts first in the low manganese regions, you can see that. Yeah? So if it starts in the low manganese regions, then it partitions carbon into the high manganese regions, which then transform into perlite. 
So this bending is completely due to chemical segregation of manganese during solidification being changed into this kind of a morphology by the rolling deformation. Okay, so this is typical in structural steels. OK, let's uh, now begin on some of the fundamentals. So uh, this is uh, your grain boundary ferrite, which is known as electromorphic ferrite because its shape doesn't reflect its crystal structure. It's basically layers of ferrite growing along the austenite grain boundaries where the diffusion coefficient is larger. So the growth rate along the grain boundary is greater than across the grain boundary. And notice that in this process, you destroy the austenite grain boundaries, which is a good thing uh, because you prevent the segregation of impurities at the austenite grain boundaries, influencing the toughness. But you can also get uh, idiomorphic ferrite, which is grains of ferrite that nucleate inside the austenite grain, like this. And they will tend to have some sort of crystallographic uh, faceting because they are not associated with uh, the austenite grain boundaries. So this kind of a structure, for example, you can find in certain forging steels where deliberate additions of vanadium have been made, which form vanadium nitrides, on which you get ferrite nucleation inside the austenite grains. Now, I'm going to just describe both electromorphic and idiomorphic ferrite as ferrite, just to be brief. And we need to understand now the mechanism by which this ferrite forms. So uh, I go back to my trusted diagram here where we have two different kinds uh, of atoms and a unit cell, and this represents austenite. Now, in a diffusional or reconstructive transformation, you have to break all these bonds and rearrange the atoms into a different pattern without changing the external shape because we don't have a shear deformation. Uh, in the case of a reconstructive transformation. So I'm going to destroy this, okay? Uh, break all the bonds and rearrange into a different arrangement here, okay? So this is a new crystal structure, ferrite. And because diffusion happened during that process, these red atoms have partitioned from the austenite into the ferrite because they prefer to be in the ferrite. So in transformations like this, uh, diffusion is necessary even if this is a pure ion. And that diffusion then helps the substitution of solutes to go into locations where they prefer to be. So manganese partitions, for example, to the austenite, whereas silicon and chromium would partition to the ferrite. And there is no external change in shape other than due to density differences. Now, this is an interesting uh, movie uh, from Toshi Koseki in Japan, where again, this is your austenite grain structure, and we're looking at this using confocal laser microscopy. And you will see that the temperature decreases uh, into where ferrite can form. Uh, so, here we go. And, uh, the temperature is decreasing here, but nothing is happening, okay? It's a, it's a very boring movie in that sense. As I continue to cool, nothing happens. Now you should contrast this with the movies I showed you previously, where we had plates of Wiedmannstadt and Farad growing and causing displacements on the surface and bainite and martensite and so forth. In this kind of a transformation, the diffusion basically prevents any shape deformation other than a density change. Okay. So reconstructive transformations are much closer to equilibrium. Uh, the strain energy term is really quite small. And furthermore, because the atoms can partition into the parent and product phases, you get a greater reduction in free energy during transformation. Okay, so let's uh, let's um, look at these layers of ferrite that form at the austenite grain boundaries. This is just martensite. This is a partially transformed specimen, transformed into a thin layer of ferrite, and then the rest of the austenite 
uh, is martensite. And you know you should uh, you should bear in mind that this layer is not a single crystal, but actually everywhere you get nucleation on the austenite grain boundary, uh, you get the development of uh, small layers, which when you look at them at a coarse structure, uh, it looks like a single layer. So once the austenite grain boundary is decorated with this ferrite, the only way for it to grow further is to thicken. That means grow in this direction or in this direction, this direction or this direction. So it's essentially one dimensional growth, the thickening of these layers. And once again, we can treat this uh, very simply. We assume that the compositions at the interface between ferrite and austenite are given by a tie line of the phase diagram. So this is the concentration in the ferrite that is in contact with austenite and the concentration in the austenite that is in contact with ferrite. And C bar is the average concentration in your steel. So <coughs> because uh, the ferrite cannot accommodate much carbon, uh, it basically partitions into the austenite and we develop a, a buildup of carbon in the austenite at the interface. Uh, and the maximum that you can get is C gamma alpha if local equilibrium is to be maintained. And once again, I'm going to assume this is a straight line instead of an error function. And therefore, we have this diffusion distance delta Z. Z star is the thickness or, or half thickness of that layer of ferrite. Now, as that concentration profile is displaced, so the ferrite thickens, uh, you have to get rid of that much carbon, okay? because this is the new position of the interface. Uh, so the rate at which you have to get rid of carbon is C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma multiplied by the interface velocity. Exactly as we did for Wiedemann statin ferrite. Okay. Now, this concentration cannot rise above C gamma alpha if we are to maintain equilibrium at the interface. So this excess carbon, which has been dumped into the austenite, must be carried away by diffusion along this gradient. And that is the second part of our equation, that we have a flux over here, which happens at a rate that ensures that this concentration remains constant. Okay, So these two terms are equal. And because we've got a straight line here, this term can be replaced by this, because this is a diffusion coefficient, and this is the uh, negative of the gradient here. Uh, C gamma alpha minus C bar divided by delta Z. Now, the difference between this and Wiedemann statin ferrite is that in the case of Wiedemann statin ferrite, this distance didn't change as the plate got longer because you're leaving the carbon behind, right, as the plate lengthens. But here we have one dimensional thickening. So any carbon must remain ahead of the interface. So we expect the diffusion distance of carbon to increase as the thickness of ferrite increases. And we can find the relationship between the thickness of the ferrite and this diffusion distance because these two areas must be equal. So this is the amount of carbon that you have to partition into the austenite to get this thickness of ferrite. And therefore this excess carbon in the austenite must be equal to this. So we solve for delta Z. Okay. Uh, all these terms are known, the thickness of the ferrite uh, and these concentration terms. So delta Z is solved. We don't need to make the assumption we made in the case of Riedmanstein ferrite that the diffusion distance is the same as the plate tip radius. Here the diffusion distance increases as the ferrite grows thicker. So if you now substitute uh, for this uh, into uh, for delta Z into this equation, then we end up with the velocity of the interface being related to all these thermodynamic quantities which take account of substitutional allowing elements as well, and a diffusion coefficient of carbon. And we've got D Z star here and Z star here. So if I take Z star over here and then integrate, we find that the thickness of the ferrite is proportional to the square root of the product of the diffusion coefficient and time. In other words, 
the growth rate slows down with time. Okay, so if you look at this curve, it has a parabolic shape. Uh, the growth rate is not constant as it was in Wigner and Farad, where the diffusion distance is constant, but it decreases as time progresses because the slope of this curve is decreasing. And of course, if I alter the carbon concentration, then I get an increase in the growth rate because carbon stabilizes austenite. And once again, I can uh, do this uh, calculation where I'm just changing the carbon concentration by 0 0.02. And you find once again that the growth rate or the thickness of the ferrite becomes very sensitive to carbon when we get to carbon concentrations which are close to the solubility limit. That's because of this term. Okay, so if the average carbon concentration in your steel is close to the solubility limit in ferrite, then you don't, you're not partitioning much carbon. So the growth rate shoots up. Okay, it, it, it can increase indefinitely as I reduce the carbon concentration towards solubility limit, and other factors might come into play like the transfer of ion atoms across the interface. Now. The important point is that there are many, many structural steels nowadays produced in hundreds of millions of tons, uh, which will have a carbon concentration of that order because we know that that makes the steel extremely tough and extremely valuable. But it also means that you must control this concentration very carefully. And you know, I think this is um, a credit to the steel industry that they can produce hundreds of millions of tons of these steels with the concentration of carbon controlled very, very carefully. Okay? I don't think there is any other industry in the world that is capable of that level of control. Okay, the parabolic relationship that we derived is because the diffusion distance increases with time. And this relationship applies to many, many other phenomena. So for example, this is the growth of uh, oxide on the surface of the steel. And you know you require uh, diffusion through the oxide for this reaction to continue. But the oxide is becoming thicker and thicker. So your diffusion distance is increasing all the time. And therefore, the thickness of the Oxide will vary parabolically with time, just like for allotromorphic ferret. If you look at ice forming on the surface of a river, okay, initially the thickening rate of ice is rapid, but then it slows down dramatically because the heat has to diffuse through the thickness of the ice to get to the surface. So that also is parabolic with time. And the pure reason why that happens is because as the thickness increases, the gradient here will decrease because you are dumping more carbon ahead of the interface. So the small thickness, this is deep. At a large thickness of ferrite, this becomes gentle. Let me now uh, point out the approximations that uh, I have assumed. Okay. First of all, the far field composition does not change. That means C bar, the average composition, far away from the interface remains fixed. Obviously, that's not correct if we have a large volume fraction of ferrite, but all of these approximations we know how to handle if you look at uh, my book, Theory of Transformations in Metals and uh, in Steels. Uh, we have assumed that growth is diffusion controlled, but if it becomes very rapid, then other rate controlling processes begin to consume some of the free energy. And we will assume one dimensional growth. This is not necessary. We can deal with uh, um, more complex growth and all the equations for that, et cetera, are available. OK, now. The fundamental uh, principle we are using is that we will have local equilibrium at the interface, OK? That this composition and this composition are given by a tie line of the equilibrium phase diagram. Now, the reason for this is that although these concentrations are different, the free energy of carbon in austenite is the same as the free energy of carbon in ferrite if we choose these values. And by free energy, I mean the chemical potential of carbon in austenite is the same as the chemical potential of carbon in ferrite. 
So even though the concentrations are, are, are different, the free energies are equal and therefore there's no tendency for carbon to leave the austenite and go into ferrite. Okay? And chemical potential is very easy to explain. If uh, this is my free energy curve for let's say iron and carbon, and we have a composition X, if I draw a tangent here, then the intercepts here give me the chemical potential of B and the chemical potential of A in this phase. Now, why is that? Well, what we are doing is we are taking the free energy of this solution of this composition, and we are dividing it into a part that is due to A. Okay, so this is the chemical potential of A per mole of A, and this is the mole fraction of A. And this is the chemical potential of B and the mole fraction of B. So effectively, you're saying that this is the free energy of a B atom in a solution of composition X, and this is of A atom in a solution of composition A. So you separated out the total free energy into a component due to A and B. And that is why when we are looking at equilibrium between two phases, uh, a tangent that is common to the two phases will give us equal chemical potential for carbon in ferrite and in austenite. So even though these compositions are different, there's no tendency for the transfer of carbon between these two phases at equilibrium. Now, supposing we add manganese, okay, then the situation becomes like this. And you know, some of this was in uh, Bo Sunman's uh, talk on open calfite. So this is now no longer a curve, but it's a it's a surface in three dimensions, like a football, okay, uh, as is a surface in three dimensions. So this is the free energy surface of ferrite and the free energy surface of austenite, and we are plotting iron, carbon, manganese. And instead of a common tangent, uh, we draw a tangent plane which touches the two surfaces. And wherever it touches, we will get equilibrium because the chemical potentials of the three elements will be identical in both phases. But we have an extra degree of freedom because you can take this tangent plane and you can rock it while it maintains contact with both surfaces. So at a constant temperature, okay, we can have a two-phase field. You can't have that uh, in, in a, a binary system you will have just one tie line in a binary system. Here we have an infinite number of tie lines and a ferrite plus austenite phase field at a constant temperature. So how do we deal with uh, both manganese and carbon diffusing? Well, you know, this equation, which I had previously, instead of writing one equation, we write two equations here, that the rate at which carbon is partitioned multiplied, uh, this is the interface velocity, must equal the rate at which it's being carried away from the interface by diffusion. Okay, and this is the gradient of carbon. But in a ternary system, you know, the diffusion of carbon will also depend on the gradient of manganese. Right? So that's an additional complication. And similarly, we have to have a second equation dealing with manganese and how the diffusion of manganese depends on the gradient of carbon. But notice that we have just one single velocity here. And for the moment, I'm going to ignore this, okay? These uh, cross diffusion terms and simplify the problem. So we have just one interface velocity, but these two terms are incredibly different. This is about eight orders of magnitude slower than the diffusion of carbon. So these terms are different, but not eight orders of magnitude different. So how, how can we how can we cope with a single interface moving, and yet we have two different dramatically different diffusion coefficients? How can the flux of manganese and carbon keep up and maintain local equilibrium at the interface? Well, I'm going to show you an example here. So this is again our ternary phase diagram: manganese and carbon, and this is our alloy, and these are typical tie lines, right, which you calculate using CalFed. So I've got this alloy, and it's very unlikely that I can satisfy both of these e two equations simultaneously, unless I do something to compensate for the large diffusion coefficient of carbon by 
a large diffusion coefficient of carbon by reducing its gradient. So how can I reduce the gradient of carbon? Well, if I draw a vertical construction line and I pick this as the tie line controlling the interface, then we will get a zero gradient of carbon because the carbon concentration in the alloy is the same as that in the austenite. So the profile of carbon is dramatically reduced to compensate for its large diffusion coefficient, whereas manganese will diffuse over a long distance. So this is a way in which you can, uh, you can um, get local equilibrium at the interface because you now have a choice of tie lines. It's not a single tie line that you have in a binary phase diagram. Uh, and by reducing the gradient of carbon, you compensate for its large diffusion coefficient. And the second uh, way is uh, if I can increase the gradient of manganese by partitioning very little manganese, okay, by drawing a horizontal line, you know, the manganese concentration in the ferrite is almost the same as in the alloy and therefore there's very little partitioning and we get a steep gradient of manganese and long range partitioning of carbon and we've compensated for the small diffusion coefficient by the large gradient here. Okay. Now, all of this is embedded in computer programs like uh, Dictra or MatCalc and many others. Right? So we can deal not just with a ternary system using these principles, but a multi-component system, you know, where you have 10 different alloying elements. Assuming that growth is diffusion controlled and assuming that you have local equilibrium maintained for all species at the interface. Now, in this iron carbon phase diagram, you know, we've focused on this region where we have low carbon concentrations, but you can also get uh, cementite precipitating as a lotromorphs. Okay, so this is now cementite precipitating in a hyper eutectoid steel where you get layers of cementite, you get Wiedmannstaten cementite, and you get idiomorphs of uh, cementite as well. So all the principles that we have uh, covered for a lotromorphic ferrite apply to cementite formation as well, except that the cementite is absorbing carbon from the austenite, whereas the ferrite is partitioning carbon into the austenite. Now, I've given you quite a lot of uh, theory, and I've told you that the theory is available in uh, standard computer programs, but the calculation for ferrite has many, many difficulties which are often ignored by using these computer programs, okay? Uh, so for example, you know, if I, if I go back, uh, this gradient is just too steep. It's mathematically ridiculously steep. Uh, and you can show that that cannot happen physically because the diffusion distance of manganese becomes smaller than an interatomic spacing. And when you have very steep diffusion coefficients, uh, diffusion gradients, uh, there is another theory which you have to use, okay? Because actually diffusion slows down if the gradient becomes very, very steep. But that is another story. The second uh, thing that is ignored uh, completely is that these allotriomorphs of ferrite advance by a step mechanism very often, okay? So on the side of the grain where they have a good orientation relationship, the mobility of this area is small, and therefore it's translated into that direction by the motion of a step. And this is a photoemission electron microscope uh, dynamic observation of these steps moving by Edmonds and Honeycomb. Now, we, we have the theory to calculate the rate at which a step would move. Okay, And uh, if this is a step here, very small step, then you develop a, a diffusion profile of carbon around that step. So there's lots of theory to deal with this. And we also get carbide or other compound precipitation at the steps. 
So you, as the steps move, they leave behind a whole sequence of precipitate particles. Uh, so that will obviously complicate the analysis because the carbides take up carbon, which should be partitioned in the austenite in their absence. But you know this is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful mechanism because it produces very fine arrays of precipitates, and this has had a huge revival recently because uh, someone in an earlier lecture asked me about stretch flangibility, all right, uh, or hole expansion test. So hole expansion test is where you have a hole in a piece of uh, flat steel and then you draw it out and see when cracks appear around the hole. So very often when you're making car components, you will already have punched holes in the flat sheet, which is then drawn out into the shape of a, um, the inside of a door or whatever, or a bumper. So you don't want cracks to develop around the hole. And the reason why those cracks form is because, yeah, you know, if you take a dual phase steel or a triple assisted steel, you have a mixture of hard phases and soft phases. So that makes your material uh, mechanically heterogeneous. So uniform strain is more difficult to achieve. Now, supposing you make a steel containing these fine dispersions of carbides and just ferrite, it will have a uniform microstructure. And here is uh, an example. This is a 0 0.04 carbon steel uh, containing titanium and molybdenum. And these are the fine arrays of precipitates that you get. And uh, the idea for using this for cars comes from, um, um, now, which company is it uh, in Japan? It's not Nippon Steel. Um, the name will come back to me, but uh, they gave it a trade name called Haitan, all right? Uh, and it relies on these extremely fine carbides and there's a combination of titanium and molybdenum so that the lattice parameter of these carbides uh, matches well the lattice parameter of the ferrite, and therefore you don't get coarsening when the coil uh, is, uh, when the uh, rolled product is coiled. Uh, you know, the temperature might be 600 degrees centigrade when it's coiled. And this has a really good uh, hole expansion coefficient and so forth, all the formability parameters, because it's uh, mechanically hot homogeneous material. So it's quite important that we understand these steps that move at the ferrite austenite interface. Uh, and, you know, imagine that you have a step nucleating at this, uh, uh, this is a ferrite allotromorph, and this is a step forming. Then in, in forming this step, you've created uh, some interface, okay? Uh, and this segment Z here, uh, multiplied by the interfacial energy between the ferrite and the austenite. We've also created an edge which will have a certain energy per unit length. And, uh, you know, the height of this step will determine how much ferrite forms and therefore how much free energy change we gain from the difference in the free energies of austenite and ferrite. Uh, and if, if I differentiate this equation now with respect to, uh, you know, the rho, which is the height of the step, and z, which is this length, uh, and simplify. Then you get the critical height for a step would be related to the interfacial energy and the driving force. So the far greater the driving force, the finer will be the steps. And the smaller the interfacial energy, the uh, shorter will be the steps. OK. Um, I can plot that here, that function. And this is simply giving you the minimum possible height okay, of the step. It's not telling you the actual height. It's simply saying if all the free energy, if I set to zero, this to zero, if all the free energy is consumed in creating this step, then this is the minimum height that I can get. So we are not able to predict the actual height of the steps, but the trend here is correct, and there are more important issues. You know, we don't actually understand the nucleation rate of trains of steps. That means it's not just a single step moving, okay? 
there are many steps moving at the same time. So this we call a train of steps. And there is absolutely no theory to predict the nucleation rate of the steps and therefore the topology of this interface. In other words, you know, the distance between steps, the heights of these steps and so on. So what I'm saying is that we are not able to calculate accurately the volume fraction of ferrite that forms as a function of alloying elements, temperature and processing. And that is because we are ignoring some very important aspects of the interface and simply producing a very crude agreement between experiment and theory by ignoring the topology of the interface. And this needs to uh, be addressed. So a lot more attention needs to be paid to even if you don't have these precipitates to predict the topology of a stepped interface. In other words, the height of the steps and the distance between the steps. And then, uh, of course, if you introduce precipitation at the same time, the problem is even more complicated. So right now, I would say it's better to do experiments than try and do a calculation because there are just too many things that are unknown. OK, so. I will end uh, today's lecture here. And uh, in the next lecture, I'll be covering uh, perlite, which is.